Welcome to this hour of readings, reflections and quiet prayer. If you have a running order and a hymn book, you have everything you need. Please be aware that we won't always sing the whole hymn, sometimes just a single verse, but this is indicated in the running order. Please remain seated other than for the hymns when you may wish to stand. So let's now turn to the service order as we begin in prayer. Please join in wherever you see the bold print. Almighty God, who in your tender love for us all sent Jesus your Son to take our human form upon him and suffer death upon the cross, grant us grace to follow his example of patience and humility and so be brought to the glory of his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All we born of woman have but a short time to live. We have our fill of sorrow. We blossom like a flower and wither away. We slip away like a shadow and do not stay. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. In the midst of life, we are in death. Where can we turn for help? Only to you, Lord, who are justly angered by our sins. Holy God, shut not your ears to our prayers, but spare us, O Lord. Holy God, you know all the secrets of our hearts. Forgive us our sins. Holy God, eternal and merciful judge, in life and at the hour of our death, suffer us not to be separated from you. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and merciful Saviour, deliver us and raise us up at the last day. May Almighty God, who sent his Son into the world for our salvation, Grant us pardon and peace, now and forever. Amen. It's been traditional during a Good Friday meditation to consider the meaning of the five physical wounds of Jesus. The scourging, the crown of thorns, his hands, his feet, and the spear but he also bears deep wounds to his soul in his arrest, trial and crucifixion. And it is five of these that we will consider in this hour. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. We sing verse 3 of my love, my song is love unknown. Sweet praise the same. 
we're tempted to think of Judas as a villain from the start. But that's not how most of the Gospels portray him. John, for sure, spits blood every time he mentions Judas' name. He is so enraged by him. He cannot comprehend how someone who has walked in the light can choose darkness. But mostly we see Judas as one of the twelve, close to Jesus, trusted, a disciple, a friend. And that is why the betrayal is such a deep wound. If it were an enemy who had done this, then I could have borne it. But it was even you, my companion and my own familiar friend. And Jesus still addresses him as friend, even at the moment of betrayal, not sarcastically, but genuinely and with the deepest sadness. Though we pro prove false, Jesus remains true, for he cannot be false to his own nature. It may be that you've experienced betrayal and know what a deep wound it is. We are all aware in our age that we have betrayed the gift of creation, bleeding dry what we should be cherishing and tending. But it is how Jesus bears betrayal that shines out in his passion. No bitterness or resentment, no retribution or revenge, just a deep, deep sadness for one who is lost, who the light can no longer reach. So let us pray quietly in our hearts for all who have been betrayed, for our world in crisis, and for the courage to learn lessons and to change.
those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. sing verses 1 to 3 of the servant king. The truth is rarely convenient and never flexible, to misquote Oscar Wilde. But the Sanhedrin really, really wanted it to be. The world's logic goes, this is where we need to be. This is how we get there. How do we spin the story so that we can achieve it? It's become so normal that we almost accept it. And that's the trouble. 
the religious leaders think they're doing the right thing. Don't cause a riot, don't annoy the Romans, and so the low-profile disposal of the fly in their ointment is justified. Justified, made just, or rather, made to look just. Injustice is the burden of most of the human race, whose voice is never heard. In many ways, the pandemic we recently lived through amplified the injustices that were present already. The poorest, the disadvantaged, the disabled, all suffered more than the comfortable in their isolation. Jesus remains silent. He holds his peace. Our challenge is to root out and fight injustice wherever we find it, in ourselves as well as in the world. His cross is to endure it, to absorb it and forgive it. And as he has always done, hold unflinchingly to the truth, whatever the cost. So quietly in our hearts we pray for all who suffer injustice, for those for whom the right choice is costly, and for all who suffer the hardest burdens.
Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him, and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. We sing verse 5 of my song is love unknown. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The last words of the Gospel of the Watch from the Maundy Thursday service. And haunting words they are. For all the disciples it's a wake-up call more shaming than the one Jesus gave them in Gethsemane. And especially for Peter who said, even if I have to die with you. The clash of our spiritual aspirations and our mortal frailty could hardly be stronger. The good that I would do, I do not. And the wrong that I would not, I do. Paul's lament could easily be Peter's, yours or mine or most people's. But it's Jesus we're focusing on here. And there's a danger that we assume friends don't matter too much to him. He had communion with the Father. He was a single man, not needing a spouse, a partner, a lover. And anyway, Maybe he didn't like the disciples very much. He was always saying, oh, you of little faith, and such. But we know that none of that is true. If ever a human needed a friend, it's Jesus. Now, on Good Friday. If ever it would have been good for just one voice to have said, he healed me, 
I owe him everything. It's now. If ever Peter's usual unswerving loyalty and devotion would have been a balm to Jesus' soul, it is now. But it's not to be, for how then would scripture be fulfilled? The scripture, by the way, that says, God is with us. And so he must be abandoned forsaken by his friends? Or how would God be with us when we are? So we pray quietly in our hearts for all who feel abandoned by those who they rely on, for ourselves in times of failure and shame, and for those whose need for love and tenderness is not met. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, 
shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. sing, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? A bunch of schoolboys around the lion's enclosure in the zoo. Not a bad description of the crowd. It's safe to taunt and mock because he's caged now. We've got him where we want him. Where's all the majesty and wisdom of this noble beast now? Where is the power that makes him king. True, we wouldn't want to meet him out in the wild, and we're just a little nervous that he might break out. But that makes us feel all the more brave and in control. We can poke him and he doesn't even growl. Mockery doesn't seem at first glance to be the most painful wound after all that Jesus had already endured. 
but it is the wound of our faith in our age. Like a young person who mentions on Twitter that they're off to church. Immediately they're seen differently and not taken seriously. The religious person in the TV soaps never listened to. We don't mind being mocked, but it's the precious things that we hold dear that are counted as worthless in the mockery. It's the same for Jesus. Taunts and insults are hardly going to offend his self-esteem. But it's all humanity that is being mocked. It's the love shining out on the cross and enduring every human darkness for our sake and for the sake of those who wag their heads, showing the human spirit at its most glorious and most tender that is being chewed up and spat out. So let us pray in the quietness of our hearts for all who endure mockery and disdain, for those we have hurt or offended, for this time of world crisis, to bear fruit of thoughtfulness and new beginnings. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of them standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, 
Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. We stand to sing the hymn, And Can It Be, verses 1, 3, and 5. So he is not to be spared anything. When times had been hard, when he was up against it, Jesus had his most fundamental lifeline. He went up the mountain to pray. He journeyed to a quiet place to pray. He spent all night in prayer. At his baptism, at the transfiguration, at crucial moments, 
the approval from his heavenly Father gave him strength, gave him validity, gave him encouragement. God was there for him. Not now. Yes, he knew it had to happen. Yes, he was prepared for it in his mind. Yes, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground. But this is it. And it's harder than even Jesus imagined. God seems a million miles away. But that is the one thing our faith gives us that is unique. That is why I am a Christian and could not conceive of following any other faith. Because when we feel God is a million miles away, and we certainly do feel it, he is not. He is there because Jesus cried why have you forsaken me, means everything has gone, all the support and lifelines and escape routes and consolation is gone. He has emptied himself of all but love. And he does not, will not, can never forsake us. So, in the quietness of our hearts, let us pray for all who feel at the end of their resources, for ourselves, our loved ones, and all humanity, unable to be there for one another. Let us pray.
Jesus, Saviour of the world, come to us in your mercy. We look to you to save and help us. By your suffering and trials, you set your people free. We look to you to come to our aid. By your cross and your life laid down, you raise us up. We look to you to save and help us. You saved your disciples when they were ready to perish. We look to you to come to our aid. In the greatness of your mercy, loose us from our chains. Forgive the sins of all your people. Make yourself known as our saviour and mighty deliverer. Save us and help us, that we may praise you. Come now and dwell with us, Lord Christ Jesus. Hear our prayer and be with us always. And when you come again in your great glory, make us to be one with you and to share the life of your kingdom. And we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Most merciful God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you delivered and saved us all. Through faith in him who suffered on the cross, may we triumph in the power of his victory. Amen. Amen. 